Hi, I'm Rachel, and this is my AM reading video for my birthday weekend in July 2022. Technically, my birthday was on a Friday, but I am taking over the weekend as well. It is my right, I say. <laughs> also, it gives me more to talk about, huzzah, which I suppose I should really get to because I am not quite sure how long this battery is going to last. Actually, it had only one bar when I turned it on, but it has gone up to two, but it'll probably go back down to one the more I ramble here, so let's get started. So one thing I do to start most of these AM reading videos off is to read the next short story in this collection of short stories by Dorothy Parker, which I picked up, uh, started at the beginning of last May, and I am reading one short story per AM reading video. I think I said that. <laughs> anyway, uh, I am up to her story called The Custard Heart, which she published in 1939. This is a longer story for her, although it seems like she is uh, inching more into that territory again in her writing. Uh, and so uh, it follows this character called Mrs. Lanier, who, like, the first thing we hear about her is that she is wistful. And she's made it into this art of just uh, feeling just, uh, I guess, put out emotionally. And, uh, you know, it's a very self-absorbed sort of emotion about... Uh, you know, wanting things she can't have. And so she lives nicely. She has a servant who takes care of her needs. She has a bunch of young men who come to visit her. She really wants a child, but that's just not working out. So it's really a story very much just about how she's self-centered. She's really stuck in these desires that she can't have. And she's surrounded by people who she's not really paying much attention to, so it seems. Uh, and, you know, there's even an interlude here where she goes out and sees, uh, you know, people on the street who, you know, are hard up for money and that sort of thing. And it takes a lot of effort for her to feel any sort of sympathy for them and always has to sort of compare them to her, like, oh, we're all going through hard times. So it seems like it is a uh, commentary on how this level of self-absorption and of sort of loving her own wistful airs uh, really disconnects her from the rest of the world. It seems to be that's the sort of social criticism Dorothy Parker is offering today, because that's what she does in most of her stories, is offer social criticism, often against women. And I can see how there is some psychological nuance to that, but I I don't like the her this story very much. I think it's a craft thing. Uh, I don't know if I how much I have to blame on 21st century, like, um, loss of attention span for it, but still, these stories, the, these longer stories, are very passive. There's not a lot of in-person action going on in them. It's mostly this disembodied narrator telling us what this woman is like and describing the details of her parlor room. I mean, it's very different to some of uh, her earlier stories, which are this, like, witty dialogue back and forth, these very short, dashed-off stories, I called them, which were more engaging in that way, but I guess in a way that's kind of Twitter-esque, isn't it? Just like dashed off witty dialogue. But at the same time, you know, this sort of passive writing just never would sell today. You know, nothing actually is happening. Someone disembodied is telling us about this woman, and there's interesting, like, psychology to be, you know, d parsed out through that, but it's uh, not at all dynamic in terms of a storyline. Oh, shoot. Sorry, brief interlude myself as my phone went off. <laughs> so anyway, I guess... Uh, it's a good time to stop. That's pretty much where I can leave this one. <laughs> the next two books, or the first two books I both started and finished in July, are in fact both audiobooks. <laughs> uh, it's been a difficult uh, couple weeks for me, actually. Uh, the time that I usually use for reading audiobooks, I didn't have as much of that time, you know, given, you know, other stuff going on in these past couple of weeks. And it turned out that both of these books, uh, just the way that... Uh, the cookie crumbles, I guess. Uh, I got them out from the library at a certain time, and there were holds on them, and I, they'd be yoinked back for me. So I had to, like, dip into uh, some of my normal reading time, like when I had the time to do physical reading. So it's a little frustrating in that way, but alas, uh, two books down at least. Uh, so the first book I read was Eternal by Lisa Scottolini. It is historical fiction taking place in Italy in World War II, following these three families of... Uh, Roman citizens who uh, were friends and uh, largely fascist uh, before the war. Uh, two of the families in particular supported fascism and Mussolini. One was a uh, Christian Catholic family and one was a Jewish family. And so they have these two young sons who were uh, best friends, uh, Marco and Sandro. And Marco's sort of, you know, the 
Lothario, charismatic guy, not that great at school, but you know, the Mr. Popular, and then Sandro's more reserved and a lot more bookish and academic, and in fact seems to be some sort of uh, big shot mathematician, and in fact he, uh, at the beginning of the story, starting uh, in 1937, got a really prestigious uh, mathematics uh, internship. But he is from a Jewish family uh, in uh, the ghetto, so things are going to happen there. The major thrust of uh, the personal story is this uh, love triangle uh, that the two boys are having with their friend Elisabetta, who um, her family isn't fascist, and in fact, uh, the fascist uh, under uh, negative fascist undertones touch her family as well. But anyway, the crux of this story is this uh, love affair that. Uh, you know, back and forth triangle stuff that lasts through the next several uh, years uh, as Italy, the country, goes through some huge changes as uh, Mussolini, in aligning himself with Hitler, starts to enact race laws against the Jews, including his own supporters, and then ultimately joins the war, which was really devastating for Italy. Um, they did not do so well in World War II, and there were just horrible uh, effects at home in terms of the economy and uh, so forth, uh, including in Rome. Uh, so then we get to Italy, like, doing their no-confidence vote in Mussolini, but that, of course, is when the Nazis move in to occupy Rome, and for the Jews, that's when the Jews were, uh, especially in the ghetto, were um, mostly deported to Auschwitz. So that's the backs, the, what's going on, and of course, uh, uh, the historical detail is really impressive. She obviously did a lot of homework there. Of course, you know, her fictional characters had to have outsized parts in some of the political machinations, like Sandra's family is very involved in, you know, the Jewish uh, leadership and that sort of thing. And, uh, and also uh, Marco, you know, was high up in, like, the fascist organization, you know, and so forth. Um, but uh, the major thing that was a turnoff for this book is just the writing was pedestrian, the love stuff was overwrought, um, so it, it wasn't uh, that, uh, you know, well written, I suppose, and I'm feeling very snobbish about it, except uh, I, I read this for my mom and auntie's uh, book club, and my mother is even more snobbish than I am. She is, like, really scornful about this book and about the writing, uh, and... Uh, the uh, historical details aren't uh, really holding up for her as, you know, a thing to, you know, lionize this book in any way. <laughs> we actually haven't met yet uh, as a group. Uh, the two of us talk separately, and then we're going to meet up with on Zoom with the aunties in a week or so. So it'll be interesting to see how the conversation goes. I am kind of excited because I think I, it was engaging because it was so plotty and had the quick chapters. And so... I, I still enjoyed it a little bit, but, you know, obviously the writing made me roll my eyes a little and, you know, some of the details with the love story and so forth. But uh, anyway, it's nice not to be the biggest snob in the room for once. <laughs> so, yay. <laughs> the second audiobook I finished was The Age of Ash by Daniel Abraham. It is the start of a new fantasy series for him. He's written a couple of fantasy series before, but I think... Uh, I'm not alone in being a fan who came to him through his work with The Expanse, which he wrote with Ty Frank under the name James S.A. Corey, which actually was science fiction. Uh, but anyway, now he is returning to, uh, I guess, his roots, you could say, uh, in creating a new fantasy uh, secondary world, which is my favorite fantasy secondary worlds. Anyway, uh, so this takes place in the city of Kithamar. We are primarily following two... Uh, really rough scrabble young women, uh, Alice and uh, Samish, uh, who, um, you know, live in the slums and uh, basically uh, do hustles and stealing, which they call pools, uh, to survive. Like, pools involve several people, sort of, to get the catch. Uh, so anyway, they're living their lives, and then they uh, get embroiled in politics through the death of Alice's uh, brother who is involved with people who Alice at the beginning had no idea about, but she gets embroiled in trying to figure out why he died and how to sort of continue his legacy, and you know, she's going through grief about losing him. And then Samish, meanwhile, has this unrequited crush on Alice, uh, so the two of them are working together, but then they sort of break apart because Alice gets further involved in these machinations which are rather morally questionable. Uh, and so they kind of uh, split ways for a while. But anyway, then there's the uh, fantastical elements about the political machinations about who is exactly in charge of Kithamar, and, you know, there's uh, 
vyings for the throne with, you know, and the magical undertones are, uh, you know, I don't want to spoil them too much, but there definitely is a fantastical element. It's not just straight up politics, although I personally do fall for politics <laughs> in fantasy. And in fact, I think I found it difficult to get into this story. It was a little meandering at first, and I'm not a huge fan of like heists and stealing and that sort of stuff. Uh, I'm I actually am probably more interested than many in just following the rich people around who, you know, are at the center of the political drama. Uh, but ultimately, I, I really grew to, especially uh, what Alice was going through, you know, this whole idea of, like, when you're grieving someone, like, you know, how does that, you know, narrow your vision when you're trying to keep them alive, when they're actually dead, and, like, maybe you're not seeing things clearly, that sort of stuff was compelling. And Samish was less so, you know, unrequited love is kind of, you know, passive on its own, but she ultimately comes to her own realizations, I guess, about that relationship, which is interesting. Uh, and then there's definitely doors left open uh, for what's going could come next, because I think this is going to be a trilogy. Uh, really, the world building, I think, was really fantastic. I mean, I guess that's not surprising, given the, given the expanse. Uh, just, you know, he thought up so much stuff about, you know, the politics and the economics and the religious undertones so that Kithamar felt like a real place and that's something that I'm really drawn to in fantasy. I don't just want the world building to be a shallow uh, backdrop for character angst, although I do also really appreciate uh, well-drawn characters as well and I thought he did pretty well with that as well. It, so yeah, it took me a little while to get into this one, but I do think I'll stick with it. It's exciting to have a new fantasy series to, you know, follow along with, so we'll see how it goes. The first physical book I've read this year is Beautiful Little Fools by Jillian Cantor. Much like with The Age of Ash, this was on my anticipated reads list for the year. This is a, a Great Gatsby retelling. Uh, I want to say one of the first, but of course now that it's in the public domain, I think we'll get a lot more uh, I like Jillian Cantor. I read a lot of her stuff. I don't think she's really a favorite author, and I think a lot of her weaknesses are in view in this book. I just generally like, you know, the female-focused, sometimes uh, LGBTQ-focused, and sometimes Jewish-focused uh, tint of her stories, and some I like better than others, and this one I'm kind of mad about. Because anyway, she is retelling um, The Great Gatsby through the perspective of three women, uh, Daisy Buchanan, Jordan Baker, and then uh, Myrtle's sister, Catherine, who has like a very bit part in the original book. Uh, she, I think her major thing is she wants to debunk a lot of uh, the mythos, like, and question Nick's assertions about what really happened that summer that The Great Gatsby takes place, which on its surface I respect, you know? Nick is a character who should take, be taken down a peg, I think. You know, the more I think about it, he is rather judgmental, isn't he? Even though he starts, it's, it's even like the premise of the book. It's like, my dad told me to give people the benefit of the doubt, but these people freaking suck! <laughs> which, to be fair, they kind of do. But anyway... <laughs> There's so much in here, especially about the love story with Gatsby. You know, it's such a fantasy. It's so much built on his own, like, desires that it's right to be taken down. Like, you know, it's things aren't what they seem, buddy. There's so many other stories and like The Great Gatsby that are predicated on men building up the idea of women that are one-dimensional and just there to serve their needs, you know? So it's nice to think of women... Uh, being given more dimension, but ultimately I don't think that's what happened in this book, unfortunately. I don't think any of the women sounded that different from one another, and all of their, you know, personal, you know, issues just weren't much deeper than the plot. And uh, I, uh, so I was disappointed in that. Uh, I also think, you know, she talks, actually, Cantor talks in her afterward about how she was also taken with, uh, you know, Leanne Moriarty's, uh, Big Little Lies, uh, which I remember, I didn't read the book, I remember, remember seeing the miniseries on HBO, but anyway, it's like this murder mystery where, you know, these women are involved and this detective is trying to figure out the strains of how they're involved when they're obviously lying to him about, you know, how they're involved with the death. So, spoiler alert, in this book, it's not, you know, George who uh, kills Gatsby. <laughs> And there's this detective who's hired by uh, Meyer Wolfsheim to get to the bottom of it, and he thinks that what Catherine and Jordan and Daisy are saying doesn't really add up. And we see through the backstory that it indeed doesn't add up, and that Gatsby has relationships with all of these women, and uh, is really, you know, so single-minded in his pursuit of Daisy, who very much is not interested in him at all in this book. 
Uh, so he is blackmailing the other ones and that sort of thing, and uh, just uh, definitely comes off as less likable than, I guess, his enigmatic portrait. Which, again, I could appreciate. I think Gatsby is more flawed than Nick thinks he is. But the way that it goes down here, it's just so kind of pedestrian and, and uninspiring, I guess. I just, uh, I would love to have more of a feminist uh, take, especially when it comes to Daisy, I guess. I, I, I'm still drawn to Daisy. I think it's because of my own feelings of what I thought when I first read The Great Gatsby in school. And I think I was heartbroken by Daisy Buchanan. I fell out of love with her when she was so clear that she was a careless person who, you know, didn't, who smashed up other people, as Nick said, and, and then just retreated into her money with her asshole husband. Uh, and so she is a character who is so unlikable, but I feel like there's more dimension there. You know, she's easily seen as the secondary villain after Tom. And I feel like there's so much more interesting stuff that could be said about her, about the expectations that were put on her as a debutante, and about how stuck she is in this marriage, and that, you know, she's not just, you know, a mustache twirler, evil person. But what Cantor did was really absolve Daisy of all guilt, and that made her more boring, I think. And it wasn't really true to, well, it certainly wasn't true to Fitzgerald's character, and it also just wasn't that interesting. Like, instead of deepening her, it kind of flattened her, I think. So. Yeah, I mean, I enjoyed parts of this, especially just because uh, it's fun to read, you know, uh, retellings of things, you, of stories that you know well. But um, ultimately, it was a little disappointing. And finally, the book I'm kind of in the middle of right now is uh, The Stolen Child by Keith Donahue. I picked this book up uh, for my page 112 tag, which I posted a little while ago. I'll link below. Uh, really, I picked it up because the page 112 tag gave me the excuse my sister gifted this book to me for my last birthday, so uh, I was excited to actually get to it for this birthday before she, you know, never buys me another book again because I'll never read them. <laughs> and she really loved this one. It's not one I'd ever heard of before, but she loved it, so she gave it to me and wanted me to read it. Uh, it is a book about changelings. It, uh, it takes place, I guess, starting in 1949, where this young boy, Henry Day, you know, runs away from home as she, he's seven, whatever, and he's yanked away by changelings, and one of them takes his form and takes his place and takes his life. And it follows this changeling who now calls himself Henry Day throughout, uh, I guess, the next 30 years, I suppose it's supposed to be. And then it also follows the you know, the original Henry, who's now called Anna Day and is a changeling himself. And it seems like the world building of this is that these changelings like stay in the woods and they don't grow for like a hundred years or something like that. And then they find someone to sort of take the place of and the cycle continues. And meanwhile, the new Henry Day uh, finds himself as he loses his powers and becomes more human. He is in line with some of his old patterns that he had a hundred years ago when he was a boy. And particularly he becomes a piano prodigy, which the original Henry Day had no aptitude for, but he is a piano prodigy because of who he used to be. So yeah, I'm in the middle and we're just following these boys. There's a, there's a thread of this one character, this woman in red, who has an interaction with both of them, and it seems like she, on some psychological level, realizes that something weird is up with that, and thinks, like, you're the same person, but not. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I feel like, in a way, it's supposed to be allegorical about the nature of uh, growing up and of uh, changing identities, but maybe that's taking things a little far. Uh, it actually, again, I think it took me a little while to get into this, uh, especially in the beginning chapters, but now as they both are changing in different ways and uh, we're, I don't know, looking at things in a broader lens, it's, it's a little more interesting to me again. But uh, maybe I'll stop rambling now, especially since I definitely am back down to one bar, but I will be finishing this book by uh, next week and I will report back. So that about covers it for me now. Should sign off now before this goes down to no bars. I'll just wrap things up by saying that uh, if you've heard some of my recent videos, I've been whining because I lost my AC, you know, it, my unit broke down, but uh, Friday I actually did get my AC installed, my new AC, so everything is working well again and I'm, you know, I have cool air coming in. I'm very happy, huzzah. <laughs> Still have some work service, uh, you know, coming up next week, but you know, who doesn't really? <laughs> Other than that, I guess things are going well for me. I'm looking forward to new reading as I get into my new year of life post-birthday. Uh, 
Also, because it is my birthday month, I focus a little bit on short stories this month, so my next video that I hopefully will come out in the next few days will be a try a story tag video, which uh, that was something started by Jen Campbell several years ago based off the try a chapter tag, and I use it to, you know, take out a few collections of short stories and read the first, you know, story in each of them and then discuss them on camera with you. There's a few other caveats in how I play that game, but I guess I will, you know, keep that and explain that uh, coming up in the video, so stay tuned. <laughs> in the meantime, I hope you are all enjoying uh, your uh, reading in July, now that we're at about mid-month, I guess a little beyond it. <laughs> so anyway, thanks so much for watching everyone, and I'll see you next time.